Okay, let's talk a little bit about some metabolic hormones. And I'm going to pick on two fellows here. They're actually, you know, hormones are actually proteins, so I can get that into uh, a lecture like this. But the first one is insulin. Insulin production is stimulated by intake of proteins and carbohydrates and refined, low-nutrient, high-calorie foods. Now, what does insulin do? Insulin regulates glucose metabolism, and that's a key. But it also stimulates fat making. It inhibits fat breakdown. It increases cell uptake of proteins. It helps to regulate cell growth. And it increases hunger. One of the biggest things I want you to remember today, insulin is a food storage hormone. We talked about type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance. How as we start taking in excess amounts of calories, over a period of time we start developing insulin resistance. Your cells just won't take in anymore. And uh, our levels of insulin have to go up, up, up in order to get the glucose into the cell because the cells are stopping up doors like with gum stopping up the locks to the doors so the doors to the cells won't open so now insulin is a food storage hormone so as you get diabetes you're getting higher and higher levels of food storage hormones that means it is harder and harder for a person with diabetes to resist gaining weight regardless of how much they eat I have people all the time that tells me, tell me, well, you know, I gain weight, but I, I, it's just my hormones. Well, they're absolutely right. Do something about it. But they don't know what to do about it. So let's talk about what we can do about it as we go through the lecture today. In this si a simple graph, I, I have insulin over here on the side. And we're going to look at what happens to insulin as the levels change, when they're high versus when they're low. When you have a high insulin level, energy is stored as fat, and it blocks the use of fat for energy. But it inhibits the breakdown of glycogen in the liver at the same time. When your levels of insulin are low, you, you can convert glycogen to glucose in the uh, you know, from the liver, but you can't get it into the cell because there's not enough insulin to, to, to get get it into the cell. In both cases, we have cellular starvation that occurs. That's why people with diabetes, diabetes feel so tired and fatigued all the time. All they want to do is lay on the couch. You have no energy to do anything. You're just tired. The, your cells are asking for more. And when you're hungry, uh, when, when your cells are hungry, they're asking for more, so you have increased hunger. Your insulin levels are up, you have increased hunger related to that. What we want to do is we want to get back to the normal metabolism level. So let's try to manipulate our environment in order to get us back to normal metabolism. In young people, they, they tested blood sugars over a 24-hour period and plotted those out. And this is what they found. This is actually three graphs all superimposed in one. If you look at the solid red line, the solid red line is what a normal blood glucose is. You'll see on this side of the screen are blood sugar numbers that you recognize. They're 72, 90, 108, 126. Remember, that's a normal individual here. On the opposite side, over here, then you have insulin levels. And if you look at this red line, the red line is glucose. Now, for, it's a 24-hour period along the bottom. We have three meals that are eaten, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So with the breakfast meal, breakfast meal is eaten almost immediately, you see a huge surge in the glucose. That's the after meal sugar spike. And uh, the blue line, uh, on the other hand, is your insulin release. And it follows almost immediately as well. This is just a genius design, our bodies, that, I, that is. So as you go throughout the day, you eat your lunch meal, same kind of reaction. You eat your dinner meal, same kind of reaction. And then it levels off through the night. And by the time you come around to the next morning, you're back to a normal range. The dotted line, on the other hand, is a sucrose-rich meal. 
Somebody just went down to the, uh, the dairy bar and they got a banana split maybe. Had that for lunch. You'll notice how much higher the glucose spike is. You also have a much higher insulin release. But a sucrose-rich meal is also low in dietary fiber most of the time. Consequently, when that insulin goes to work and starts taking care of the glucose, blood sugar plummets. You'll notice this person has a blood sugar of probably around 60. Any individual, when they have a glucose of around 60, is going to feel weak and shaky. I've got to have a pick-me-up. Maybe I need a Coke. Maybe I need uh, to hit the vending machines, get a candy bar. I've got to have something, a bag of potato chips, something. And so you go and you snack, you get something. It's because there's a real physiological basis for your feeling. You did something wrong, but it wasn't right here when you hit the vending, vending machine. It was right here when you ate the sucrose rich meal. So that, this is just the natural thing. And the higher this peak goes, typically the lower that one goes. Now, you know, people with hypoglycemia, it's a very similar problem to diabetes. How can you solve the hypoglycemia? Increase your fiber. It'll feed you slowly over a long period of time. And uh, the, the, the same goes for our diabetes, of course. Now, there's something about this. I've taken one of those spikes, and I've just stretched it out, okay? Now, instead of that being 24 hours on the graph, that's five and a half hours on the graph. There's, uh, you eat the meal right here, and you'll notice almost immediately you start seeing that upsurge in the blood sugar. How long does it take a person to eat a meal? Well, 20 to 30 minutes. Is that fair enough? Okay. And then there's a period of time right here where that blood sugar is rising. Give or take a little bit. While that blood sugar is rising, if you'll go out there and you'll do moderate exercise, like walking, you just go for a walk for 20 minutes while that blood sugar is rising. That what has, what's happening to the sugar? Well, you know, when you exercise, anytime you exercise, it's like the cells open up and they accept up to 14 times the amount of glucose comes into the cell. And when you do it during this period of time, what happens is you take the glucose that's rising in the bloodstream, detour it into the cells, directly into the cells. What happens to that after meal sugar spike? Yeah, it lowers it. It lowers it significantly. What happens to your insulin demand? Well, your body's just magic. If your glucose isn't going up that high, then the insulin's not going up that high. Then what's going to happen to food storage? Now you're, you're channeling the energy and you're putting it where it's needed. You'll, you'll have higher energy levels and you'll have less storage of weight that happens. So there's a critical 20-minute window right in there. Now, we had a, a retired military man that came to our very first reversing diabetes seminar. And this man, he, he, he was skeptical of everything I told him. He tested as much as he could test. So he went home, and uh, the next day he cooked himself a big dinner meal. He measured out every portion, put it on his plate wrote down what he measured out, sat down and ate his meal. When he was done eating his meal, he laid the fork down and uh, got up, set the timer to 20 minutes, turned the television on, sat down in his easy chair and waited. 20 minutes later, he pricked his finger. It was over 200. So the next day, at the same time of day, he went to the refrigerator, he took out yesterday's leftovers, and using his list to make sure he made no mistakes, he measured out the exact portion of what he had had the day before and put it on his plate. He stuck it in the microwave, warmed it up in the microwave, sat down and ate, uh, ate the same meal, same proportions he had eaten the day before. When he was done with his meal, he laid his fork down, went over, turned the timer to 20 minutes, turned on the TV, 
And this time he got on his stationary bike and he rode at a moderate pace for 20 minutes. When the timer went off, he stuck his finger. It was 96. So does it work? Does it have an impact? Yes, it does. And you know, the people that go through my program, uh, one, I think exercise is one of the hardest things for people to do. But the people that go through the program, typically it will be the ones who are doing the after-meal exercise that are the first to reverse. We will see the most dramatic results with them. We're not exercising to burn calories. You're exercising to get your insulin sensitivity up you're exercising to get your insulin level down and to help control these hormones, to channel that energy where the energy needs to go. If you want to take a nap, that's the worst thing you want to do. Yes, sir, that allows insulin to do its job. It, 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 put it on the graph. <laughs> Okay, now I want to show you something about this same after meal sugar spike here. This is a person that's eating uh, a sucrose rich meal, a high glycemic index meal, potatoes, uh, uh, you know, a meat and potatoes meal or something like that uh, with, with, with a dessert, a piece of pie for dessert. Their blood sugar is going to spike up and then it's going to come back down quite rapidly. Whereas you take the same individual and feed them a high fiber diet like a bowl of lentils. If they eat the bowl of lentils, watch how slowly that sugar level goes up. What happens to your insulin level? It also is staying way down. You don't need that high level. And it feeds you for, instead of this tailing out right here, you have an extra hour or two of time that it gives you. And the higher your fiber go, the like the longer it feeds you. So the average person with diabetes, we want you to get at least 50 grams of fiber a day. And that's for this, this effect. Now, what kind of effect does it have? Well, you know, there's one other study I want to tell you about. And it's a study that puts the focus on when you eat your fiber. They took two groups of people. One group of people, they fed them their fiber I mean, they gave them the exact same food. But they told one group, you're to eat your fiber foods at the beginning of the meal. The other group, they said, you eat your fiber foods with your meal. And then they tested what happened to the glucose level after the meals. What they found out was those people who ate the fiber foods first had a 25% reduction in that postprandial spike, that after-meal sugar spike went down 25% just from eating their fiber foods first. So when I tell you to eat your fiber foods first, that's exactly what I mean. Eat your fiber foods first. People will try to eat their regular meal and then eat their fiber foods on top of that? Uh-uh. We got it all wrong. You eat your fiber foods first, then you eat your steak and potatoes or whatever else that you're eating at your meal, and uh, that will give you the results that you're looking for. What we want to do is we don't want to knock the tops off of all of these things so our after meal sugar spikes look more like that. And uh, what kind of benefits do, does a high fiber diet have? Well, it provides satiety. It modulates the sugar response, lowers those sugar spikes, lowers the insulin demand. You're able to lose weight then and uh, you will uh, have more energy promotes regularity. We do have some people that come through the program and will complain of a lot of constipation. It's usually always related to the fact that they don't drink the recommended 18 glasses of water a day. We can tell them that, but if we don't emphasize this over and over again, somebody gets into trouble and then they get angry. Um, and first of all, check these things out with your doctor before you do them. Uh, make sure that he is aware of what's going on because he will want to regulate your medicines based on what you do with your lifestyle. All right, let's talk about leptin. 
Leptin is a master metabolic hormone that we've not only known about probably within the last 10 to 15 years. And the more that we know about it, the more impressive it becomes. But leptin is a master metabolic hormone that regulates just about every metabolic activity in the body. It's uh, given off by the hypothalamus, and it sends out messengers to the rest of the body and tells the rest of the body what to do. So it will, uh, for instance, regulate your thyroid. And people with diabetes often are hypothyroid. That means you, ha you have low thyroid. And the reason is because most of the time when people are insulin resistant, they also become leptin resistant. Your body doesn't recognize what the, the leptin messenger is trying to say. It also uh, can have impact on your melatonin, which will affect how well you sleep at night. It can uh, involve uh, your sex organs, the adrenal glands, growth hormone, and even insulin and your immune system. So it's integrated with all of these systems in the body. It also regulates fat storage. And it's like it is a... Uh, um, It's a defense mechanism, an, uh, like an obesity defense mechanism or starvation defense mechanism. Let's look at how it works. In a normal individual, you have adequate fat stores. This represents the fat in the body. You have a balanced metabolism, and you have a normal appetite. So when you, it doesn't mean you don't get hungry, but it means before the meal, you get hungry. So you eat your meal, and when you're done, you're, you're, you're ready to get up and go your way, and you're satisfied. You've had, you've had a good, uh, good meal, and you can go on your way. There's a normal amount of leptin. The leptin is given off by the fat cells. It travels to the brain. The brain recognizes the leptin in the hypothalamus. I spoke wrong before when I said it was given off by the hypothalamus. It's given off by the fat cells, cells but it's recognized by the hypothalamus. Anyway, when you have a starvation that occurs, then these fat reserves get real small. And when the fat reserves get small, your body, the leptin slows your body metabolism way down. It's to, to help you survive this famine that we're in. And, but it gives you an increased appetite. You would eat just about anything, anywhere, anyhow, anyway. But you lay on the couch until you see it come by the window. And then you jump, jump up and grab it or whatever. So then uh, when a person has a plenty, they have excessive fat stores, you're giving off a huge amount of leptin. But there's a blockade up here. And the blockade prevents the hypothalamus from recognizing the uh, leptin that is there. Therefore, the hypothalamus, the brain, thinks that you're starving. So what it does is it slows your metabolism way down so you can survive the famine that you're in and gives you a voracious hunger. Have you ever experienced the feeling you get up from a meal, you intellectually know you've had plenty to eat, but you are just craving something. You don't know what it is. You're just circling the refrigerator waiting to dive in again. You, you, you get up from the meal, and the next thing you're thinking about is, what am I going to fix for the next meal? What, can, what am I going to fix again? If any of those kind of symptoms are yours, you're probably leptin resistant. In fact, 99.9% .9 of people who are overweight are leptin resistant. So, what are we going to do about it? What causes it? Well, the same thing that causes the insulin resistance actually causes the leptin resistance. It's all these junk foods that we typically uh, will feed ourselves on. Cal uh, excessive calorie consumption, insulin surges, your uh, alcohol consumption, overeating, artificial sweeteners, elevated triglycerides, snacking, eating late at night, and inadequate amounts between meals. So, can you reverse leptin resistance? The answer to that is a resounding yes. There's been a lot of study that has been done on this, and there appears to be several keys to reversal. Uh, they probably have more to do with timing than uh, the actual consumption of your food. 
But the first thing we want to do is we want to make sure that we have at least five to six hours space, time between our meals where we're not eating anything. That allows your hormonal levels to return to normal and sort of reset themselves. And no snacking. When you snack between meals, what you do is you trip a whole bunch of switches, a hormonal switches in your body, and it causes you to have extreme hunger. And so when you're trying to reset your leptin levels so you're not feeling hungry all the time, the, the wrong thing to do will be snacking. No late night eating either. Uh, your leptin levels are actually highest at night, and that's the best time uh, to, that, that your body starts to try to reset those leptin levels. How long will it take? Well, it, it can take a few days. You might feel terrible for about three days as you go on this kind of, uh, of transition. But um, stick with it. Uh, pray a lot, whatever it takes. But try to get through that three days of absolutely no snacking. You come out on the other end and you will feel a lot better. Avoid high fructose, uh, high fat combinations because those are the combinations that cause oxidative stress. Those are the kind of combinations that are going to make you uh, make your diabetes worse and make your leptin resistance worse as well. Eat low fat naturally. You've heard these phrases before, haven't you? Uh huh. And avoid sweeteners with fructose. So. Understanding hormones is key to being able to know what to do about them. We're not talking about medicines here. We're talking about what you can do in the privacy of your home to get over this problem that we call diabetes and to get over insulin resistance and leptin resistance. Need to be sure that we increase our fiber intake as well because when we increase the fiber intake, it helps feed us and get us through those long periods of time when we're not eating.